Gymnodiniales include two athicate families of dinoflagellates, the Warnoweaceae, um, the members of which are called Warnoweids, and then Polycricaceae, the members of which are called Polycricoids. Now, Polycricoids are really well studied for their diverse and really um, advanced stinging organelles and stinging organelle complexes. On the left here, we see a cell that's completely covered in stinging organelles called trichocysts. And on the right, uh, we see a close-up detail of one of these trichocysts. Now you can see it's composed of a contractile capsule within which is this structure. Um, you can't tell, but it's a, a compressed filamentous tubule, um, as well as this structure here, which you might think is kind of a spearhead that serves to pierce prey. Um, but really all it does is it pierces uh, the cover to this organelle called the operculum so that the tubule can be ejected as you see here. Now some species of polycricoids, um, in this case we're looking at polycricos cofoidii, uh, feature an organelle complex here that serves a similar function but is much much more advanced. Um, you can see that this complex is formed is uh, composed of four membrane-bound compartments. Um, the first is the capsule, which essentially functions as the, uh, the trick assist in the previous slide. You can see there's a contractile capsule within which is this filamentous tubule. Um, there's a stylet that serves to puncture this operculum. Uh, and there's a base that actually stays in the capsule um, and that guides this tubule and... Uh, and couples it to the stylet. So in addition to this capsule, there's this nozzle component that sits within the operculum um, and through which the stylet and this tubule have to travel uh, during, during ejection of this extrusome. Now the second ballistic component of this organelle complex is this tania cyst. Now this tania cyst is launched similarly to this tubule um, except it functions differently in that it seems to adhere to the cell uh, and act as kind of a toe line. Now sitting between this tania cyst and this capsule is this linker. Uh, the function of this linker isn't very well elucidated, uh, but it does serve to suggest that this tania cyst and this capsule, um, these two ballistic organelle components, are coupled in some way. Now this video demonstrates the way in which they're thought to be coupled. Um, you can see this cell here, which is a dinoflagellate, comes into contact with this cell here, which is its prey. You can see this structure attached to the prey, and that's actually that ballistic tania cyst that's attached to the dinoflagellate by a toe line, uh, which you can't see here. Now it's hypothesized that after attaching to prey using this tania cyst toe line, um, that the dinoflagellate then launches this tubule, which is injected into the prey and injects some kind of toxins. So on the left here is a short video of a dinoflagellate nematocyst, and on the right is a diagram of a nadarian nematocyst. Now nadarians include jellyfish, anemones, and the multicellular component of corals, um, and these stinging cells found in jellyfish and anemones in particular seem to be really similar to these nematocysts found in dinoflagellates. Um, in both cases you have this contractile capsule that contains a coiled filamentous tubule. Um, in both cases there's this kind of spearhead type structure that serves to pierce this operculum um, that encloses this whole thing, and in the case of nadarians can also pierce the epidermis of say an animal. Um, and in both cases um, this filamentous tubule is actually injected by similar means. Um, in both nadarians and dinoflagellates, the first step is a sudden increase in the osmolarity on the interior of this organelle. Um, and at least in the case of nadarians, this is accomplished by this polymer, which is called polygamma glutamate. Now, glutamate residues at biological pH are charged, and because they're charged, they have counter ions associated with them. Um, and so if you release a bunch of this polymer into the interior of the cell, the osmolarity shoots up extremely rapidly, um, and that's associated with a rapid influx of water. Now this influx of water causes this stylet-like structure uh, to pierce the operculum, and in the case of nadarians, to also pierce, at least sometimes, the epidermis of some prey item. Um, and then uh, this filamentous tubule is injected. 
Now in both cases, this contractile capsule uh, contracts after the operculum is dislodged. And in addition, in both cases, this coiled up tubule actually uh, generates a lot of energy as it unfurls um, because it's actually somewhat rigid and it takes some energy to pack it into this organelle. Um, now this mechanistic force as a result of this coiled tubule and this contractile capsule combines with this sudden influx of water to accelerate this filament, in some cases, over 10,000 times the acceleration due to gravity. Now, based on these similarities, uh, some scientists suggested that maybe these structures are related some way evolutionarily. Um, and so maybe these nadarians acquired them from dinoflagellates, um, or maybe both groups acquired them from bacteria, um, or s both groups um, developed them early on before they diverged way early on in evolutionary history. In order to answer this more decisively, scientists looked at this, um, this polymer, and more particularly, the genes that code for the enzyme that produces this polymer in nadarians. And so they isolated these genes, and they looked for these genes or similar sequences in dinoflagellates and in other groups of life. And what they found was that um, this polymer and the genes that produce this polymer are indeed found in bacteria, and they seem to be homologous to the genes found in, in nadarians. Now this suggests that these nadarians did in fact acquire the ability to produce this osmotic propellant from bacteria. What they didn't find um, was the same sets of genes or similar genes in dinoflagellates. And so um, while they do believe dinoflagellates use some kind of osmotic propellant in the same way nadarians do, dinoflagellates don't produce this polygamma glutamate and they don't even have the genes required to produce it. What this suggests is that this is really a case of convergent evolution, um, where both lineages ended up producing somewhat similar structures, um, but that these structures aren't actually related evolutionarily. And this really isn't that surprising when you look at the fact that these nematocysts um, are actually formed of multiple membrane-bound compartments in these organelle complexes, and are actually quite a bit more complex structurally than these nadarian nematocysts. And so this is one case where a single-celled protist was able to exceed the complexity, at least in some regard, that you see in multicellular animals.